Good morning, and welcome as we gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to see everyone here. Warm welcome if this is your first time or first time for a while with us. It's really good to have you joining us this morning. Can I just let you know a few announcements? One is we have a lunch today. Um, after this service that will be in the hall behind me. Even if you've not come prepared to stay, please feel welcome to stay. Uh, It would be lovely to spend that time with you. The reason why we're having a lunch is because we've got Ruth and Malcolm with us. Um, Ruth and Malcolm were sent out from us as a church, as well as other churches, over 25 years ago to Latvia. They've now returned to the UK back in July, uh, and it's great to have them with us uh, for today. And we're going to hear a little bit more this evening about their time in Latvia, as well as what they're going to be doing next. And then this morning, Malcolm will be preaching and Ruth will be sharing in the the children's talk with us. So it's great to have you with us. We we pray that you would be blessed being here. We would uh, know the blessing of having you here and that God would be with us today. Can I just mention a couple of things for Christmas? So next Saturday morning, uh, we're going to meet to sing carols in the town center outside the original factory shop. Um, That will be 10 o'clock, but if you want to meet here at 9.30, we're going to pray first. And then after that, um, Steve and Miriam have invited us around. Steve did tell you, didn't he? Yep. Steve and Miriam have invited us around for refreshments at their house afterwards. And then also to say we've got um, invite cards for our Christmas services. One thing to notice, the carol service on the 18th, although the kind of early publicity we had to send out in November says 5 o'clock, the time is 6 o'clock. Because we wanted it, it, it's a a service we want people to come to, as many people as possible. We're outside in the car park. We decided it probably wasn't worth competing with the World Cup final. So we've just moved it back a little bit so that people aren't having to make those decisions. So 6 o'clock on the Sunday evening, um, just to clear up any queries. And if anyone's asking that question, is it 5 or 6? We all know it's 6 o'clock. In Luke's Gospel... The angel Gabriel comes to Mary to announce the birth of Jesus. And this is what the angel said to her. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name. Anyone know? Go on, Antonio. Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. As we come to this Christmas time, we are celebrating the coming of Jesus Christ into this world, God's great King, his Son. Shall we pray and ask God to just help us uh, to know what that means and to rejoice in him this morning? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of year. We thank you that it gives us an opportunity to think of Jesus coming into this world. And Lord, what you say about him, that he is your son and he is your chosen king. He is the saviour of the world. He is the one we need. He is the one who changes everything for us. Father, as we enter this Christmas season, and as we come to this service this morning, we pray that you would show us more of Jesus, that we would be amazed by him, and that, Lord, our hearts would want to worship him. Help us, we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of songs together to begin our service. The first uh, is Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery in the Dawning of the King. It, It speaks about Jesus coming into this world and then the other things that he will do. And then uh, to respond to the truth that we sing of in this song, we will sing in Christ alone, my hope is found. So let's stand and sing. Mystery in the dark. 
Ruth is now going to come and talk to the children. We in that row are going to really see what I want to show. So if you can't see, you can come a bit closer. Oh, there we go. I hate technology. Now, I've got in my bag three things that I want to show you. You maybe know that I haven't been living in this country for a very long time. I've been living in a different country that you have to travel to by an aeroplane. And this year, we moved back to live in this country after 26 years, which is a very long time. So you can imagine we had a lot of stuff. Have you traveled on an aeroplane? Anybody been on an aeroplane? Yeah? You can't take a lot of stuff on an aeroplane, can you? So guess what? I had to leave a lot of stuff behind. I couldn't bring it all. So I had to decide, what am I bringing? What am I giving away to my friends back there? So I couldn't bring big things. Right, so I've got three small things I'm going to show you that I brought back from Latvia. Here's the first one. Can you see that? Do you know what it is? What does it look like? It's made of wood. <coughs> yeah. Tap it, made of wood. If you shake it, you can hear a little noise as well. So it's a Russian doll, because where I was living, there's a lot of Russian people, a lot of Ukrainian people as well. But look at this. Ooh, did you hear that? What's inside? It's another one. Now, if we had a long time, I would keep opening these. But you can see me afterwards, and I will show you how many are inside. I'll tell you, because you won't believe me, though. Ten. All right? So I wanted to bring that back. And it doesn't weigh a lot, so you can take it on a plane. Next thing I brought back. It's a bit different. What's that look like? I think I better put that here. Every time I bend down, the microphone's going to fall. What do you think that is? It's not a poo, all right? <laughs> Don't be worried. This is from Italy, because I love going on holiday to Italy. And this is from Mount Vesuvius, which is a volcano. And I've been up that volcano, and this is a piece of the volcano. Probably not allowed to take it, but somebody, <laughs> somebody gave it to me in my defense. So that is a very interesting thing. Now, I've got one more thing to show you. This. Does that look interesting? <coughs> no, <laughs> it doesn't look interesting. I'm glad you said that. that was the right answer. What do you think it is? Do you want to hold it? Have a feel. Yes, what do you think it is? Bible. You, well, you're almost right. It's part of the Bible. But it's not like a... Feel that. What do you think? Feel that. It's it is a book. Does it feel like a normal book to you? <coughs> no, what does it feel like? Do you feel those pages? They're not like normal pages, are they? What does it feel like? I think, well, perhaps we better ask somebody a bit older. <laughs> Test now. What do you think those pages feel like? It's not, it's not a joke. It's not, I'm not trying to trick you. What do you think it feels like? It feels like plastic, don't you think? It feels like plastic. Now, this is in Russian. It's not written in English. And it is the Gospel of Luke, which is one of the books in the Bible. Now, why would you make it so small? And why would you make the pages like plastic? What do you think? I will tell you. I will tell you. Because when this was made, this book, the Bible was not allowed. You couldn't have a Bible. Because the people ruling the country said there is no God. We don't want anyone to believe in God. And so we don't want anyone to read a Bible. So, all right, said all the Christians, we won't have a Bible. Do you think that's what they said? No, of course not. So they said, well, we've got to have a Bible that's very small, and we've got to have a Bible that we can hide very easily if the secret police come looking for it, because if they found a Bible, you could go to prison. So this Bible, it's, well, this book of Luke, if I'm cooking in the kitchen, there's a knock on the door, and it's the police. You just drop it into your pan of soup, and they don't know it's there. 
And then when they've gone, you get it out, you wash it, and you can read it. Or, if you're not cooking soup, but you've got a cup of coffee, just pop it in your cup of coffee, and they won't see it. Or, if you haven't got any hot food at all, but you've got time to get outside, you can bury it in your garden, and then you can dig it up again, and it will still be okay. Now, don't try this with your normal Bible, because <laughs> none of that will work, <laughs> okay? But I wanted to bring this to show you, and of course, I brought my own Bible, my big Bible. I brought that back with me as well. I don't care how big that is. I need it, don't I? Why do we need the Bible? Why is it so important? Yeah. It's God's word. Yeah, what were you going to say? So we can learn about God. And we need the Bible because it's true. And it tells us things about God that we couldn't know. It tells us about Jesus. So I just want to say to you, when you come to SOS, when you come to church, or when you read the Bible at home, what you're doing is something really life-changing. And it's true. So really take it seriously. I'm sure you do. And just remember, there are still countries in the world today where Christians can't just sit and read a Bible they might go to prison or worse. And so remember to pray for them as well. Okay? I'm going to hand back to, to Paul now. Thank you for that, Ruth. We're going to sing now. And this is a very short song, so we're going to sing it twice. But actually, it's a really important song because it summarizes for us the main message of the Bible, the message about Jesus. And it summarizes for us the message of Christmas. Holy God in love became perfect man to take or bear my blame. That's Jesus coming down from heaven into this world to take on our sin. On the cross, he took my sin, and by his death, I live again. So we're going to stand and sing it through twice. As I mentioned, we have Ruth and Malcolm with us for the whole day, uh, and this evening we're going to be particularly focusing on praying for them, um, thanking God for the 26 years in Latvia and all that God did through that, and also looking to their future and um, their planned move, or they're already in Cardiff, but they're taking up a role within the church in Cardiff. But I thought this morning as we come together to pray, we could pray for Grace Church in Riga, uh, the church that Malcolm Ruth were involved in um, founding and planting. 
and we can pray for, for them over this Christmas time, for the leadership of the church, and for the church as it seeks to, to go forward and to grow and to reach out with the gospel. And then also be praying for ourselves over this Christmas time, for Christmas Unwrapped and for other outreach opportunities that we have over this Christmas time. So shall we come and pray together? Father, we thank you for the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you that as God of this world, the God who made us, when we rebelled against you, you didn't say that's it. But no, you promised to send your son into the world to die for our sins. to reverse the fall, to bring us to you, to restore us to a right standing as your people, your children, that through Christ today, who rose from the dead, through trusting in him, through being united to him, we can stand here this morning and call you our heavenly Father. We can come with a boldness because we know that you love us and that love will never end. Father, we are sorry for our sin. We're sorry for the rebellion in our hearts and in our lives. We're sorry that even though you've shown us Jesus, even though you you may have brought us to him in faith, we still love other things more than him. Father, please forgive us. Please change us. Please transform us. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit among us this morning and in the hearts of every believer. We thank you for his work, that he is changing us to make us more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, as we... As we come together this morning, as we worship you together, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our lives. Speak to us through your word. Change us. Encourage us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we pray for ourselves, we do pray for our brothers and sisters in Riga. We pray particularly for Grace Church there. We pray that you would bless them as they meet together today. We ask that you would encourage them. We pray for Andis, their pastor, and we pray for Andre and other elders, Lord. We pray that you would help them and equip them to lead the church. That, Lord, as they counsel and preach and teach your word, we pray that you would give them discernment and understanding and the words to say. We pray that there will be power in the preaching power to change lives and make a difference. We pray for the the new members who are, are coming in to join the church, these 20 or so people. We thank you for that encouragement. And we pray for them, that they would be blessed by being part of the church and, and a real blessing to the body of your people there. We pray for others who are coming along who are not yet believers in Jesus Christ. We pray for their salvation. We pray that you would open their eyes to see that there's something more here than just being with a group of people on a Sunday. That you are real. And that you invite us to know you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the building that you've given to them in the the center of Riga. And it's encouraging to hear that it's already at times too small. Lord, we pray for wisdom and provision in dealing with that that again, you would guide and that you would direct. And we pray as they seek to reach out with the gospel in the city of Riga, we pray that you would give opportunities to speak of Jesus, that that you would give a clarity to explain, not just to explain so that we might understand as Christians, but explain so that the people that they're speaking to may really grasp how amazing It is that Jesus came into this world. And Lord, we pray the same for ourselves over this Christmas time. We pray for Christmas unwrapped this week. 
Thank you for this opportunity to share the message of Jesus with children in the schools. We pray that you would use that. You would use that now. You would use that in the future, in their hearts and in their lives. We pray for our outreach services and we pray for coffee connections this week. We think of lunch break last week. Lord, we pray that you would use these opportunities you've given us to share the gospel. We, we pray for Monday Club and, and Wipeout and Seedlings. Lord, we pray that as we share Christ with others, it, it may not just fall on polite hearts, but that, Lord, you would have been at work preparing those hearts with an eagerness to hear about Jesus and a desire to know him. For, Father, there is no one like Christ and no one that can make such a difference in our lives. Lord, will you work over this Christmas time, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's stand uh, to sing again. Rejoice and be glad. The Redeemer has come. Without going for the, the classical Christmas songs, I've gone for songs this morning that do point us towards the coming of Jesus. So this is another one. Rejoice and be glad. The Redeemer has come. Go look on his cradle, his cross and his tomb. Sound his praises. Tell the story of him who was slain. Sound his praises. Tell with gladness. He liveth again. Shall we stand and sing?
mo- in a moment, Malcolm is going to come and share God's word with us from 2 Samuel 7, but we're going to read that together first. So I'm going to read it. It will be on the screen behind me as well, but if you have a Bible, you may like to open to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, when the king lived in his house... And the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. The king here is King David. The king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I? O Lord God, and what is my house that you brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come, and this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. And what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. Because of your promise, and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness, to make your servant know it. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, a nation, and its gods. And you established for yourself your people Israel to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. And now, O Lord God, confirm forever the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house. And do as you have spoken. And your name will be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. For you... O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servants, saying, I will build you a house. 
Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken. And with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Paul, for uh, reading uh, from God's Word. And it's a great privilege to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, we worked out, it was 30 years ago that we first came to Whittlesea. And we lived in the, the manse there. It was very different then. We lived there before we went out to... Uh, to Latvia. And as we've come back uh, from Latvia this year, people have often asked me, is there a need to send missionaries anymore? And my answer to that is, yes, of course there is, uh, because people need to know about God. God is worthy to be known and, and uh, praised by people from all over the world, every nation, tribe, and tongue. And um, the best people to talk about God to others are those who know him best, people like you. And that's why I wanted this uh, passage read from 2 Samuel chapter 7, because in that passage we learn one thing about God that is so important for us to understand. It's uh, essential for any Christian to know or anyone to know about, actually, And without knowing this truth, you will never go with joy to tell other people about Jesus Christ. You'll never go to other nations to speak of this great God. So what is that thing you're asking? What is the thing in this passage that everyone ought to know about? I'm glad you asked that because that's what I'm going to talk about. But turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And first of all, you see there, as Paul said, King David is sitting in his palace. He's at home there. And an idea comes to his mind. He's thinking, I have a very nice house. But what about God? If you remember the the tabernacle before, where God dwelt, symbolically, of course, he's everywhere. But that had fallen into disrepair. And David is thinking, you know, I've got a very nice house. God ought to have a nice house. I will build a house for God. And Nathan, who is the prophet there, thinks that's a great idea. I mean, if you're a pastor or a leader of a church and someone comes to you asking they want to do something, you say, yes, of course. And Nathan says, that's a brilliant idea. But then he goes home and Nathan sleeps. And in that, as he's there, uh, God speaks to him. And he says, go back to David and tell him he is not to build a house for me. Look at uh, verses um, 5 to 7. And why does God say to David, don't build a house for me? It's because of this very important truth that I want you all to grasp this morning. Look at verses 8 to 11, what God says. He says, go to my servant David and say, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you and I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth and I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more and violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. Do you see what God is saying? God is saying... I did this, I did this, I, 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 I took you, David, I made your name great, I cut off all your enemies from you. This is the truth I want us all to understand this morning. We don't do anything for God. We always, only, ever respond to what God has first done 
for us. No, David, you will not build a house for me, but I am going to build a house for you. Now, you might think, well, hold on a minute. David's already got the house, a very nice house, actually. Why is God going to build him a palace or another house? Well, he's not using that word in the same way as David was using. He's talking about, I'm going to build a house, a family line, a dynasty for you. You know, just as King Charles is of the dynasty of Windsor, he's part of the Windsor family. He is of the line of the Windsors. God is saying to David, I am going to make a family line for you, a dynasty for you. And this is what I want you to grasp this morning. If you're going to know about God, this is the important thing to know about him. Know that God is always the initiator. God is always the giver. He is always the one who first acts. We always only ever receive from him, respond to him. We are always only the beneficiaries. That's the important thing to understand. Now, if you were to go back in history and you were look at many kings, many kings in the past used to build magnificent structures or temples or buildings for their gods. And why did they do that? They did that to get their gods on their side so that the gods would give them victory against their enemies or they would give them success in battle or they would strengthen their rule. But the God of the Bible is not like the other gods. You can't get him on your side by building him a home. You can't bribe the God of the Bible. You can't use him. Because the God of the Bible is always the initiator. He always makes the first move. He is always the first to act. No, David... You don't build a house for me to win my favor. I have already made you king. I have already defended you from all of your enemies. And I will establish your rule and your reign forever. Before you build me a house, I am already building a house for you. I start, you respond. I give, you get. I bless, you receive. And it's so important to grasp that. So important. I'm not exaggerating here, but I believe that if you take that truth, if you make that truth real in your own hearts, that characteristic of God, what God is like, then it will transform you. It will change your whole way of looking at this world, of looking at your life. It will give you wonder and joy and peace and and confidence. It will equip you for a lifetime of ministry and service. You see, many people think that the God of the Bible is the exact opposite of how he is portrayed here in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Many people think it begins with me. If I do something, then God responds to what I have done. I make the first move and then God blesses me. If I help old ladies across the road, or if I go to church, or read my Bible, or put money in the offering, God sees these things, and God is pleased with me, and God responds to my acts, and God blesses me. But that's not how the God of the Bible operates. He says, come to me with nothing. Don't come with your good deeds or your religious acts or your moral good works. 
Come to me with nothing and I will bless you. And that's radical. That, that separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. If you think about Hinduism, you know, it says, do your religious duty. If you're devoted to the gods, then the gods will bless you. Or take Islam, for example. Do the will of Allah, obey his commands, follow his his, uh, teachings, and then he will bless you with paradise if you do enough. Every religion says, do, 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 do. Do. And if you do it good enough, then the God, the deity, will respond to what you have done and will bless you. But the God of the Bible, and the God of the Bible has a name, his name is Yahweh. The God of the world says, I'm not like the other gods. I'm a God of grace. You, you, you don't build me a home first, and then I respond. No, I will build a home for you. I take the initiative. I make the first move. I take the first step, and we only respond to him. And that, you might think, well, you know, Malcolm, you've chosen this obscure passage in the Old Testament just to prove this point. But I would say to you, no, 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 this is written on every page of the Bible, what I'm saying. It's right the way through the Bible. You take the, go right back to the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, and, and you have, you know, about creation. And have you ever noticed it said it was, there was evening and then there was morning the first day and then the second day, evening, morning. And you think, like, that's a bit strange, because we talk about morning and then evening, that's a day, but the Bible talks about evening and then morning. And what's that saying to us? It's reminding us that when we get up in the morning, God's day has already begun. He's already been at work. And when we go out to work, he's already worked for us to enable us to work. We only respond to what he has already done for us. Or you take, read on a little bit more in the book of Genesis and you come to the story of, you know, the Tower of Babel and what did they want to do? They wanted to make their name great. We make our name great. We climb up to God. And God comes down and crushes that. But the very next chapter, that's Genesis 11, Genesis chapter 12, what do we find? God goes looking for a man who has no thoughts of God at all. In fact, he's worshipping other gods. A man called Abraham. And he goes to him and he says, I will make your name great amongst the nations. I will bless you. And I will make you a blessing to the whole world. And you go to the next book, in the book of Exodus, and you see that you know, God gives his people the Ten Commandments. And then you say, ah, there you are, you see. God gives the law. And he says, if you obey the law, then he will bless you. And I say, no, 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 you've forgotten the first part of the story. Where were his people? They were enslaved in Egypt. And God rescued them. He sent them Moses. And he rescued them from Pharaoh. And he rescued them from death. And he brought them out of that place. And then he brings to them their law so that they can respond to what he has already done. He always takes the initiative. He always makes the first move. We are always only receivers. And that order is vitally important. We know it in our own lives if we're Christians here this morning. Before we were born, He knew us. He knit us together in his mother's womb, in our mother's womb. From all eternity, he knew us and he loved us. And when we were in our sin and in our trespasses, in the darkness and our guilt, what did he do? He rescued us. It wasn't we who did that. If there had been some kind of medicine 
that would wipe away our sin and our guilt and our shame, we wouldn't even be able to reach out and take that medicine because we were dead in our sins and trespasses. But he, by the power of the Holy Spirit, gave us life, spiritual life. And he gave us faith and he gave us repentance and he turned us around and he showed us the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ and he adopted us into his family and he made us his children. He did all of that. It began with him, not with us. And if you change that order, then you're back into the darkness of religion where there is no hope, no peace, no joy. God promises to build for David a house. And if you look at verses 12 and 13, he says that even David's death is not going to bring an end to what God is doing that he will build that house, that family, that dynasty, that kingdom that will never, ever end. In verses 14 and 15, he says that even sin will not stop God from fulfilling his promises to David. God is building there on the promises that he first gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And you know the story at this time of year when Joseph and Mary are going to where? To Bethlehem to be registered. Why? Because of the the line, the family of David. And yes, the baby that was born at Christmas time is that promised Davidic king, Jesus Christ, who overcame sin and death by his own death on the cross and then rising again on the third day. Every religion says, do, 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 and you will be blessed. And Christianity says, no, God has done for you everything in Jesus Christ. He's lived the life that you've not lived. He died the death that you deserve. And if you change your thinking about him and yourself and this world, and you come and you stop your doing... Stop your doing and turn simply with open arms and empty arms to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will receive you. And that's grace. That's grace. Now, I'm very conscious time is running away, but three things. I'll see if I can do it in five minutes or six, maybe. Three things just from this, I mean, that goes on. Because uh, verse 18, if you look at verse 18, how does David respond to this? Firstly, he responds with humbleness, humbleness. He's amazed. Why, God, would you do this for me? He's full of gratitude. God has been so good to him. And you know, every one of you here this morning, God has been good to you. He's given you life and health now. Every breath that you breathe, that's a gift from God. Every heartbeat is a gift from God. There's not one of you here this morning, no matter what has happened in your lives, there's not one of you here this morning that can say God has not been good to you. And then you think, why would he love me? Why would he send his son to be born, to live, to die for me? Why would he save me? Why would he adopt me? And the only answer to that is grace, amazing grace. And I don't want you to lose that. If you are a Christian already, I want you to hold on to that. It is amazing. It is something that you have not earned and not worked for. And you could never earn it. But you know, as Christians, we sometimes fall into that. We can often think, I'm working for the Lord and now I deserve something from him. You know the older brother in Luke 15, that's what happens to him. And you can see that when his father comes to him and he says, all these years, what, I've been serving you, I've rejoiced. No, I've been slaving for you all these years and you never gave to me. And he's angry, there's no joy in his life and he feels hard done by, by his father. And his father comes to him and he says, you know, all I have 
It's, it's yours. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And we've done nothing to deserve that. He's just given it to us and we receive it. And don't lose that amazement or that joy in what God has given to you. So this grace humbles us. But there, secondly, there's a confidence. In verse 19, and I don't have time to go into it, but um, the, the, you read the commentators and they've all got different opinions about how this verse should be translated. Um, I think what God is saying here is he's promising to deal with his people in a new way. He's promising to deal with his people through a king. And we see that later on. You know, when the king disobeys God, then all the people suffer. They're all sent into exile in Babylon because of Manasseh, the king's sins. Now, what does that mean for you and me? It means something amazing. God now treats us on the basis of his king, Jesus. And that's good news. If God treated you on the basis of your own obedience or disobedience, it would constantly be changing, wouldn't it? You'd never know where you were with God. You know, one day you get up early and you read your Bible and you go out and you tell people about Jesus and that's a great day and you think, great, God's going to bless me now. But then there are those days when you get up and the alarm goes off and you go, ah, oh, I'm going to stay in bed. And you don't get time to read your Bible and you don't take that opportunity to witness to someone, then you feel terribly. And it's, you feel that guilt and that shame, and you just want to go and hide from God. But the good news is that God doesn't do you on the basis of what you've done or not done. But he deals with you on the basis of what Christ has done, his king has done. And that's great news. It is this 33 years of Jesus' life where he never said anything wrong or did anything wrong or, 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 or felt anything wrong. He was perfect. Perfect obedience, the righteousness of Christ. And when we have sinned and when we have not taken those opportunities and we feel that guilt, what do we do? We don't look inward. We don't look at all the wrong that we've done, but we look away from ourselves and we look up to heaven, to Jesus Christ, our perfect righteousness, our perfect obedience, right there at Father's right hand. And we say, he's my hope. Not what I have done, but what he has done for me. And we take confidence from that and we repent of our sin and we get up and we go out again with new strength. There is a confidence. There's humility, amazing grace to me. There is confidence. And then lastly here, um, what does David do? Well, David doesn't stand, sit there all the time just saying this is amazing and wonderful, but he actually gets up. He gets up and he actually, he doesn't go and build the temple for God, but he prepares. He gets things ready for his son, Solomon, to build the temple. So I'm not saying to you this morning, you don't have to do anything for God. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's the order. That's the important thing. You can't do anything for God until you know what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And so some of you here this morning need to stop. Stop your doing. And you need to sit, and you need to look at Jesus Christ, and you need to be silent, and you need to do nothing until you grasp what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And you can delight in that and be amazed by all what he has done for you. But if you are rejoicing in Jesus Christ this morning, then the time is to get up now and give yourself in grateful thanks back to him.
out of the overflow of God's grace, we show grace to others. We proclaim grace to others. We live graciously amongst our neighbours, our friends, our communities, our uh, work colleagues. We don't build a house for God. He is already building his church. But those who know his grace and delight in his grace and are amazed by his grace, they're the ones that God uses in building his kingdom. So my friends, sit and be amazed. Behold him on the throne, seated on the throne. There's no one like him. Adore him, worship him. And then humbly and confidently get up and do what he has given you to do for the glory of his wonderful name. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We are amazed at your love for us, especially this Christmas time as we gaze at that little baby in the manger. We're amazed that Jesus Christ would come, that he would leave heaven's glory, come into this world for people like us. We don't deserve it. We certainly haven't earned it. But you are a God of grace. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would work in our hearts, that we would know and be confident of that grace in our own lives, and that we would get up and that we would respond to that glorious grace with our lives, giving you our lives in service. And Lord, I do pray for anyone here this morning to whom all of this is mumbo-jumbo and they just don't get it. Lord, open eyes. We, we needed your work in our lives to understand this in the first place. Open their eyes, Lord, I pray. Give them understanding even this morning. Give them faith. Give them repentance. Give them Jesus. We pray in his precious name. Amen. We're going to sing our closing hymn, and it's um, that great hymn by John Newton, Amazing Grace. Uh, and John Newton is one of those people who never got over the amazing grace of God to him. So let's stand and sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
there's a church lunch afterwards, so don't rush off. But let's say the grace together. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.